So, you know, the first question is why we need method at all and why method is an area of social science inquiry. So method isn't just something that we do. Um, it's something that we study and that we debate about and how it is that we can best know something. And the question of how it is that we can know something are, is referred to as an epistemological uh, question. Uh, epistem is the root of that word, which means knowledge. And so how do we know the things that we know? And in different societies and in different periods of time, there's been different ways in which people have claimed that they could know something. So one way that we could claim to know something is from the authority of God, and that by studying a series of religious texts, we could know something. And this is actually a, a very, very common way um, uh, throughout many human societies in which we come to understand something. Um, uh, there are other claims about how it is that we could know something. Um, we might ground those claims in our own personal experience. So why is it that you know that um, uh, 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 oven is hot? Well, when you touch it, you experience it as hot, and that is knowledge. A method is something that allows us to systematically study the social world, and the idea that there would be a method is a claim that the method allows us access to legitimate knowledge. In this sense, methods, whoops, excuse me, methods are the subject of vigorous debates, in part because there are debates about what legitimate knowledge looks like. What is the overall legitimacy of a claim to knowledge? How do we know if something is true? And even among people who consider themselves social scientists, there are debates over the epistemic foundation of a series of claims or how it is that you could really know something. I, in general, will take a point of view that was developed during the period of time sort of called the Enlightenment, um, uh, and which sees that, uh, uh, that falsification is the most critical element of um, research methodology. Or instead of just thinking in terms of falsification or that word, you might think what scientists do is ask how they might be wrong. So the constant question of a scientist is, how might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? Now, what this means is that what we do is ask not to how we can prove what we already believe, but how we can critically evaluate a hypothesis. When we do something called hypothesis testing in the social sciences, what we're effectively trying to do is disprove that which we think may be the case. So let me give you an example of, of, of why it is that we do this. Um, let's say for a moment that I wanted to establish the gender of, um, of professors. And I had a hypothesis that uh, all professors were men. And so I kind of looked in the mirror and I was like, well, I'm a professor and I'm a man. So obviously my hypothesis must be true. Well, from a research perspective, this is not a very good way to try and um, evaluate your claim, in part because what you're doing is seeking to affirm what you already think. Instead, what I should do, if my hypothesis is all professors are men, is to go and look for women who are professors. And one of the things I would very quickly find is that there are many women who are professors. And so my claim that all professors are men is clearly incorrect. And so I might then say, well, I was not able to support my hypothesis. When we construct a hypothesis, we never prove it. What we do is we, we, we come to a point where we say, I was unable to gather sufficient evidence to disprove it. And so there are some good reasons to believe it. So as you begin to enter into the social sciences and in sociology, and you think about what does it mean to be a researcher? What does it mean to be a scholar? What that means is that instead of seeking to affirm what you already believe, what you need to do is critically evaluate it and critically evaluate the hypotheses that you have and constantly struggle to prove yourself wrong. 
And this should be your kind of orientation, the scholastic orientation is to ask, how could I be wrong? How could I be wrong? What are examples of where I'm wrong? Now, this is a really kind of scary thing to do, I'll admit, because what it means is that you're constantly ser searching for, in some ways, things you don't know or, or, or your, the own falsehood of your claims. But that is the foundation of science. It is the foundation of social science inquiry and many scientific inquiries. And so skepticism, a kind of organized skepticism around the claims that you're making is essential to being any kind of research scientist, whether that's a social scientist or a natural scientist. Now, you might think to yourself, well, if you're constantly looking for instances where you're wrong, won't you find them? And the answer is yes, you will constantly find instances where you're wrong, or you'll find many, many instances where you're wrong. And what that helps you do is not necessarily disprove everything in the world, but often put parameters on it. That is to say, well, within at least this range of things, it's likely right, but there are lots of cases where it's not. This orientation, this orientation of organized skepticism or constantly asking yourself, how might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? Is essential to any scientific inquiry. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't establish anything or that we can't make claims in the world. In fact, when we attempt to rigorously test things, sometimes we come up with really keen insights. And I want to give as an example here the work of Diva Pager and an audit study that she did in the early 2000s, um, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, about the effect of having a criminal record on the likelihood of being employed. In this work, what Pager noted was that across many, many studies, what we see is a strong association between having formally been incarcerated, that is having formally been in jail, and having a low level of employment. But where many scholars had sort of made the assumption that incarceration affected employment, that assumption really was just that an assumption, because what it was was an association between two factors. We saw that people who had been incarcerated were less likely to be employed. But there are lots of reasons why that could be the case. So it's not necessarily the case that incarceration is causally explanatory for the lack of employment. Think of it this way. People who are incarcerated have lots of other traits. They're not incarcerated randomly. They're incarcerated typically for some reason. So what if the reasons they're incarcerated also explain their lack of employment? Imagine, for example, that asocial behavior is related to incarceration. So people who have a lower capacity to create social ties with other people are more likely to be incarcerated. That's a hypothesis. It may not be true. Well, that same asocial behavior may also be related to low levels of employment. If you have a difficult time connecting with other people, you may be less likely also to be employed. Or maybe people who are incarcerated don't have the same sets of moral commitments that other people have, and that that becomes obvious when applying for a job and people are less likely to hire them. So there are lots of alternate hypotheses to the hypothesis that having formerly been incarcerated itself is causally explanatory for low levels of employment. What Diva Pager did then was to design a method or to use a method and design a study that allowed her to causally evaluate the effect of a criminal record or what she calls the mark of a criminal record on subsequent employment. And Diva's study, um, which is kind of, in some ways, a gold standard study for a long period of time for many of us, did the following. She took four young men. Two of them were African-American. Two of them were white. She gave them the same exact uh, resume. So they had the same exact set of qualifications, except in one instance, 
um, or actually two instances, uh, they were assigned a criminal record. And in two instances, they were not. So one of the African-American men would have been assigned a criminal record randomly, and one of the white men would have been assigned a criminal record randomly. And she used what we'll refer to in future lectures, lectures as the magic of randomization in order to eliminate all of the other potential explanatory factors. So everything else that could potentially explain the effect of a criminal record, she eliminated through randomization. And if you want to know how that magic works, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to outline that for you. This experimental audit study, this would be referred to as an audit study, showed through this random assignment that there was a significant impact of having a criminal record on your employment. So everything else being the same, those people with a criminal record, those people who applied for jobs with a criminal record, were much less likely in Pager's audit study to be called back after submitting an application. Now, what this did was causally establish something that we already knew. And what it reflected was Pager's scientific orientation. And by scientific orientation, what I mean is that Pager asked herself, how might we be wrong? How might all of these assumptions that we've been making about the effect of a criminal record, which has really just been based on an association, not a causal explanation, how could have that been wrong? And she critically evaluated it. There's something else that's very important about Pager's study, and it's particularly important in the context of the United States. What's important about Pager's study is that she also saw a huge effect of race. Or, um, put differently, what she saw was that there was a significant effect of a criminal record, but in some ways, the racial effects were even more dramatic. Now, the reason Pager was deeply interested in race here was because Black Americans are much more likely to be incarcerated than white Americans. And so, Pager was interested in evaluating the effect of a criminal record given this disproportionate experience of incarceration. And as we'll talk about later in this class, the, um, uh, 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 the salary gaps or the wage gaps between Black and white Americans are significant. And we may think about the ways in which this experience of incarceration has an effect on those wage gaps or explains part of them. Now, how dramatic are these wage gaps between black and whites? Well, um, as we'll show in a couple of weeks or in a, in a couple of lectures, excuse me, they're quite significant. In Pager's own study, the way in which she designed it was that the black and white applicants had exactly the same resumes. So they were basically the same person on paper. And she used um, uh, uh, actual people to walk into a place to apply for a job. So for managers, it was um, uh, physically um, uh, uh, clear what the race of the people applying was. And she used racialized names on the resumes. So black and white Americans often have different kinds of names that are highly associated with race. What Pager found was that black applicants without a criminal record were less likely to receive a callback from um, employers than white applicants with a criminal record. I'll repeat that because it's actually a really dramatic finding. Black applicants without a criminal record were less likely to receive a callback than white applicants with a criminal record. Now, this is a profound effect in part because everything else about those people was the same. And so what Pager's study did was causally evaluate, in some ways, both the relationship between race and employment and a criminal record and employment, and allowed us, through a well-designed study, to demonstrate the relationship between these two things in a way that's quite convincing. Now, the study's not perfect. There are a range of things that we could criticize with it. And one of the things about being a social scientist is we constantly criticize studies. 
It doesn't mean that we don't respect the scientists. It means that we are seeking all the time to improve our knowledge. So the question, how might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? How might I be wrong? Is in part a question of how we might be wrong. And the orientation of social scientists and scientists in general is a community orientation. Nobody owns knowledge. Instead, we as a community collectively dedicate ourselves to trying to know things. We collectively dedicate ourselves to understanding. And so one of the things that we do is we might criticize the studies that we look at that, that are being produced, not out of a disrespect to the scholar who produced them, but instead out of this constant attempt to critically evaluate the work that's put before us. So one of the challenges for uh, Pager's audit study is that, you know, it was done in a particular time and in a particular place. The study was done in, you know, a Midwestern city with a very particular set of racial dynamics. It was done at a particular time in American uh, life. Um, the people who applied were not actually exactly the same. Um, there were all kinds of things that might partially explain some of what's happening. And so that means as scientists, we function as a community to constantly evaluate, reevaluate, and refine our understanding of the world through a collective agreement on what methods are and look like and a critical orientation that takes as its organizing principle skepticism of all findings. Now, before we go too far into this, uh, uh, this um, approach to method, I want us to take one major step back because before research can ever begin, one of the things that we need to think about are our ethics. Research ethics are essential, not just to social science research, as I say here, but to all research, since we conduct people research on people. And, you know, the, there are two critical moments in, in the um, uh, uh, workings of research ethics that um, scholars in the U.S. and really across the world um, point to in terms of doing research on human subjects. The first is in relationship to Nazi experiments. So the ways in which the German Reich between the 1930s and 1940s did experiments on people without their consent. So um, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, groups of people were intentionally infected with things like bacteria, or dirt, or glass. And, um, and uh, uh, this was done in order to improve medical care. But the people who experienced this had no capacity to say, I do not consent to this research. Instead, they were forced or compelled to be part of research projects. And so, um, after the war, uh, one of the critical considerations for the world was not just what do we do about um, the genocide that just happened among Jews throughout Europe, um, this horrific uh, um, uh, murder of a group of people, but also what do we do about the ways in which we undertake our research and publish that research? And so, um, you know, this is uh, uh, an example of the picture, which is quite graphic, of, uh, of Helena Hegier, who um, was part of uh, the Nuremberg trials. So there were a series of trials after um, uh, the collapse and, and, and defeat of Nazi Germany. And um, part of those trials were uh, uh, to critically evaluate the ways in which scientists used imprisoned populations to advance their own understanding and where they treated human beings like, they, like inhuman things. So they treated human beings in the ways in which some geneticists might treat fruit flies, where they simply did whatever they wanted to these other humans. And so the Nuremberg Code was the first international code of ethics for research on people. Um, and it emphasized several principles, including avoiding unnecessary suffering 
that the risks needed to justify the benefits and that the subjects must take uh, part voluntarily. So here, um, I'm, I want to outline four major principles that we still adhere to today as researchers. The first is that we need to avoid unnecessary suffering, that the suffering of our research subjects is something that is not just needs to be justifiable if it happens at all, and it cannot be unnecessary. And we'll get to an example of unnecessary suffering in a moment. The second is that we need to have a risk and reward framework, that the risk that we're asking human subjects to uh, take on by being part of our research needs to just be justified by the benefits of the study. We can't ask research subjects to take on huge personal risks for small potential rewards. So you might be willing to uh, um, subject some people to pretty significant risks if, say, they themselves are dying of cancer and you are close to having a cure for that kind of cancer. In that instance, the risk is fairly high for maybe some of your studies, but the reward might be fairly high. But if the reward is, say, having a better, you know, um, uh, app on your phone for like playing some game, there needs to be minimal risks to the people involved. And so we engage in this evaluation of risks and rewards. The subjects themselves have to take part voluntarily and they must be able to stop at any time. This is the third critical element of research ethics. Subjects have to take part voluntarily and they should be able to stop at any time. We refer to this as informed consent. Informed consent is the idea that subjects are informed about what's going to happen and the risks of the study. And on the basis of that information, they consent to the research that they're going to participate in. Now, this creates some problems because sometimes we want to deceive research subjects about what we're doing. Psychology frequently does this, but so too does sociology. We'll talk in a little bit about such deception and how it might be justifiable in some instances. But overall, our perspective is subjects need to be informed about the risks that they're taking on personally in participating in a research project. Finally, if researchers find that there are significant risks to the subjects that, they, that are participating in the study, they are ethically obligated to stop the research they're doing. We actually see this in the moment that I'm lecturing to you right now, where there have been different studies done on COVID and on things that may help treat or reduce the risk of death of COVID. And that in some of these studies, they're seeing elevated risks of death. And rather than complete the study, they stop it immediately because they realize that they, there are significant risks to the subjects and they therefore need to stop the study that they're doing. So the Nuremberg Code was adopted internationally. It wasn't actually law in the United States. And so for a while, researchers, particularly in the US, where I'm lecturing to you from, researchers weren't legally forced to follow it. And there weren't criminal penalties for failing to do so. This led to something in the United States, um, which is really should be, you know, kind of an instance of, of national shame which is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. And this was a study of syphilis of black men in Alabama that was done from 1932 to 1972. So there were a group of medical and social researchers interested in the effects of syphilis on a population. And the study, you know, went on for 40 years and they told the participants that they had quote unquote bad blood. They knew in fact, that the participants had syphilis, but they did not inform them of this. Most critically, there was a cure for syphilis that became available. And researchers did not tell the men either that they had syphilis or that there was a cure possible for the disease that they had. 
This study led to lifelong complications and illnesses of people and many preventable deaths. And here we see a picture of a, one of the doctors involved who was drawing blood in part of this, part of this Tuskegee study um, from this population. Now, there were a series of critical things that this study was doing that fundamentally violated the very Nuremberg Code that researchers across the world had largely committed to um, by 1946. The first was that the researchers lied to the people under study. And, um, uh, and, and they never offered to help the men who were suffering. The cure for syphilis is penicillin, and penicillin became available in about 1947. So in 1947, they could have cured all of these men of syphilis, as well as most all subsequent people of the experience of syphilis. But doctors refused to reveal this option to people and continued to lie to them about their diagnosis because they were curious about how syphilis would progress if it was left untreated. Many, some of the men died. They also infected their partners or wives who then also did not receive treatment. The women who got syphilis were, able, were transferring it, many of them, to their children, which led to a series of complications among children that included blindness, epilepsy, physical deformations, low birth weight, developmental delays, and poor uh, lifetime health. So this study had major negative impacts on lots of people, the men, their partners, their children. It led to, when it was revealed, and there was a whistleblower that sort of said, what are we doing here in 1972 about this? And it led to expanded rules and regulations about ethics of research. And today, in the United States at least, all research funded by the federal government has to go through a review, what's called an IRB review, to ensure the ethical treatment of subjects and informed consent is required for all federally funded research. So IRB refers to Institutional Review Board. And today, um, I'm a researcher at a university in the United States. Every human subjects research project that I do, I cannot even begin until I go through the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. And what this means is that I outline the, the research that I'm interested in undertaking and I talk to them about the different processes that are going to be involved in that research. And what the IRB is interested in and should be interested in is the treatment of human subjects, the ethical treatment of human subjects. And that ethical treatment is really grounded in the principles that emerged from the Nuremberg Codes after the um, uh, Second World War. Those principles are principles of the moderation of risk and reward, of making sure that all research involves informed consent, and increasingly that the data that we gather as researchers um, is data that uh, is protected so that the information that I gather can, can, in most instances, preserve the confidentiality and privacy of the research subjects that I'm working with. So people like me, can almost never do secret research. Instead, when we interact with people in the world, we have to tell them, I am a researcher. This is the purpose of my research. These are the risks to you to being involved. If you're concerned about it, here's who you should contact from the university in order to express that concern. These steps and this ethical orientation to human subjects research are absolutely essential. And some research today continues to be done without the consent of people. So there's research that's done, for example, on military populations that doesn't involve full consent, et cetera. And scholars like myself are deeply critical of that because we think that fundamental respect for humans and recognition of human dignity and autonomy is essential, that no one should be subject to research, be that biological or biomedical research or social science research without the capacity to evaluate what's happening and to affirm or consent to 
being part of the research experience. So I'm going to stop here. And in the subsequent lecture, we're going to talk about different types of research methods.